um, support team, Ms. Jennifer Smith and also Ms. Crystal Graham, who is going to help us in this. And so let me go back and share my screen. Okay, I want to make sure that we have everything right. And also, um, I'm going to ask everyone to go on mute while we are on, so that way we don't have any um, backlog. Oh gosh. Yep, we're having a little technical difficulties, um, but that's all right. Yes, okay, good. All right, so let's just go ahead and get this party started. So, love and respect for Black men. We are the daughters of Black men. We are the wives of Black men. We are the mothers of Black men. We are the sisters of Black men. And we date Black men. We want our daughters to marry Black men. We work with Black men. We respect Black men. We revere Black men. We are thankful for Black men. We need all Black men and boys to live. All Black men matter and all Black lives matter. Let's see if this video is Can I see work. that slide again? Yes, give me a second, we'll go back to that. Dear black man, dear black man, dear black man, dear black man, I know that the world um, wants to portray you to be a certain thing, but I see you. You are beautiful. You are smart. You are valued. You are a king. You are someone's love, someone's light. You are a friend, a lover, a father. I see you guys out there being providers. I see you being loving. Young men like my son could look at you you and say if he did it i could do it your past does not have to define your future the struggle is there but at the same time we believe in you i'm sorry that the world sees you sometimes as a scary person you're not scary you're someone's son you're someone's husband and i truly love you you can do it i value you don't let nothing stop you because young men are looking up to you you are very necessary. Never forget that because we need you. I will always be here forever as your queen. Okay. Give me a second, everybody. So today, we're going to be talking to three amazing men. First, we're going to have uh, Jeremy McBride. He is the owner of Comfort LA. Their offices are in downtown, excuse me, their restaurant is in downtown Los Angeles and Inglewood. He's a flavor finesta. He's an entrepreneur, educator, advocate, actor, and we have his uh, Instagram handles here. And I'm not sure, Jeremy, are you with us yet? Nope. Yeah, I'm here. All right. You I'm are? Here. Yeah. Oh, okay, awesome. So I wanted you to come on and say hi to everyone. What's going on, y'all? How's it, everybody? All right. Clearly due to the circumstances. And then we have um, John. And John has... Um, he is with the East Side Writers Bike Club. He's a husband and a father, community advocate, organizer, um, and he is just an amazing man. John, are you with us? Can you unmute yourself? There it is. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, how's everyone doing today? Honored to be here with everyone. 
Awesome, thank you. And then last but not least, we have Seth Brundle. I know him as Christopher. And then he is the CEO of Brundle Fly Group. He is a husband, father, chef, TV personality, lifestyle creator, or excuse me, expert lifestyle creator. He's a, a fashion professional and a Morehouse man. Chris, join us and say hello to everyone. Hey, hey how's everybody doing? All right. So I'm going to start with Chris. And I'm going to start with the man and the myth because I've been knowing Christopher, Seth, since he was a young man. And so, um, Chris, why don't you man, join us? Boy. I'm sorry? I said not even a young man, a little boy. A little boy, absolutely. Right about this age here. I just love uh, these two pictures because, wow, it's been... Uh, are you 30 still something here, right? years since then I've known you. This is amazing. And to see your growth. And so I want you to join us and um, I want to talk about who you are. Um, and also congratulations because today is your third anniversary, right? Yeah, well, technically yesterday was my three year anniversary. Today is our six year we became boyfriend and girlfriend anniversary. Awesome. Now has everyone yeah. seen this video? No. Okay, so we've got to figure out what's going on. We have, okay. Let's come back here. Seth, my son is going to Morehouse in the fall. I was just messaging you back, congratulations. Um, I will, uh, either myself or Candy will uh, share uh, my email address at the end. So please reach out to me because there is a very strong uh, Morehouse and Spelman Los Angeles Alumni Association. Um, so I would like to get him involved. I went to our annual summer picnic for the first time uh, my freshman year, summer freshman year before going into Morehouse and I've been connected ever since, so. Thank you so much, I would love that, thank you. No problem. So my apologies, everyone. I'm going to scroll back right quick because I'm talking and I'm showing what I thought was the video and I wasn't. So this is Jeremy McBride. And we're going to get to Jeremy in just a little bit. We have John Jones and we will get to him in a little bit. And now we're talking to Seth slash Christopher. And this is the young man, the baby, the little boy that I knew and now the man that I know. And so Chris, as we kind of go through um, our, each one of us, what I'd like you to do is take a little bit of time and just talk a little bit about the pictures. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through each one of the gentlemen, give you all your own individual time, and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about the importance of being a man. What does that mean to be a man, to be a black man, to be a black man in Los Angeles in 2020 or in this world in 2020? And also what's been going on in the world, how has that impacted us and what do you think about it? So right now we're just gonna focus on who are you? So uh, what's, what, what was happening with um, this bottle? Cause you look like you was partying and I need um, to have some of that. This was actually, this was one of our promotional photos from uh, the third season of my show Butter and Brown that's on uh, Magic Johnson's network, Aspire TV. Um, so I actually wasn't partying and I wasn't drinking. There was no, uh, wine bottle opener on the set and nobody brought any alcohol. So I was incredibly sober when, when I took that photo. Um, but yeah, we wanted to do, uh, kind of a riff on the polo classic and, uh, with that style of dress for our promotional photo. So that's what that is. Um, nice. yeah. So, so, um, I said we're talking about fathers and fatherhood. And so I love these photos. Um, it's important that we talk about black marriages and black relationships. Most people don't know, but not only am I married, but I've been married to the same black man for 38 years this year. So these are some beautiful pictures. Talk about your wife. Um, so like I had mentioned a minute ago, my, uh, my wife and I have been uh, dating 
for over nine years. Uh, we became boyfriend and girlfriend six years ago today. Um, and then we got married three years ago yesterday. Um, and um, she is literally the, the light of my life. Um, we, we have a very strong relationship through prayer and counseling and therapy and growth. Um, she is my rock. She holds this household down. She holds my son and I down. Um, she is the reason why I've been able to thrive in my career for the past couple of years. She provides, you know, any support that it, that it is that I need. Um, she's super resourceful. Um, and I'm just in love. And I'm, I'm very grateful for my, my Black and African queen. She's half uh, Eritrean. Um, yeah, yeah. Love being in love, love my marriage, love where we are. We have an incredible uh, black male uh, marriage counselor who is incredible and, um, you know, just has given us a bunch of tools that we've needed to thrive, um, especially going into our, um, going into our second year of marriage. So very nice. grateful for him. Yeah. And we see that she's pregnant here, but I love this photo. This photo yeah. is everything. Yeah. My little boy, he's, he's not that little anymore. Though. He's almost, uh, he'll be two in a couple months. All right. But, but this is my, uh, my first born son and my only son, Selassie. Um, he was born October uh, 2018. It has been quite a journey being a dad. I've been an uncle for 19 years, but I've only been a dad for a, uh, 20 months or so. And it's been an incredible journey, but I've learned a lot. Um, and yeah. Yeah, it's just incredible to be his father. Okay. So talk to us about the work that you do. Because, um, you know, I've watched you go through a lot. You have graduated from college, and then you started a, a job, and you were doing, um, I guess you were doing fashion and all kinds of fashion, and then you became a chef. What's up with that? How did that happen? Talk to us about what that is and what so you're doing. When I, when I graduated from Morehouse, um, I would interned in the entertainment department at Mattel, the toy company. And um, I graduated with a degree in marketing. When I did walk, uh, Mattel did massive layoffs and they dissolved my department. So I went into um, a career in PR and marketing. Um, I was really good at it, um, but I knew after a couple of years that it wasn't what I was truly passionate about. So I quit my job in PR and immediately pursued a career in uh, styling. So I was a wardrobe stylist for six years. I worked with uh, Issa Rae, of course, who's a, a close friend of mine. Tiana Taylor, uh, Chris Brown, and a bunch of other people. And I did that for about six years and I loved it until I didn't. And in the interim, um, I've always been in the kitchen. You know, you've known me almost my entire life. I've always been in the kitchen with my, my mom and my grandmother, always had an interest in cooking, but never really considered uh, a career in culinary. And um, my friend Leslie, who's my, my co-star, uh, Butter and Brown uh, approached me one day and said, you know, we should do a cooking show on Issa's YouTube channel. And I had never really considered that route as far as like being in front of the camera or anything like that. It was always fashion and food was just something that I was really good at. And um, when we started doing the web series, uh, this was back in 2014, I think I, f I found a uh, second spark just like I did with fashion and anything else that I've been interested in throughout my life. And I just poured my all into it. And luckily, after we did a season of Butter and Brown on the web, uh, we were contacted by Aspire TV to take the web series to uh, television. And we started that development process with them in 2015. And we've been on uh, their network ever since. We just last year um, finished and completed our third season of uh, Butter and Brown. And um, I have a couple of other opportunities that I'm working on. Um, I'm another digital.
debuted this month, but our production schedules got messed up with, uh, with COVID. Um, but I'm working on something with Issa Rae's uh, production company now, and I shoot a pilot for, uh, for BuzzFeed in a couple of weeks. So that's kind of how I went from, you know, Morehouse and marketing and PR to um, this career in front of the camera and culinary. And I love it. It was, it was very unexpected, but I'm very blessed to have found um, um, in this industry. Wow, that's pretty awesome. So you didn't go to cooking school? I did not go to culinary school. I'm self-taught. Self-taught, wow. watching a lot of, um, so I've been a huge fan of Food Network and then they eventually rolled out a uh, cooking channel, but Food Network, cooking channel, um, since I was a teenager, um, poured over a lot of cookbooks, um, messed up a lot of good food, um, <laughs> you know, in my pursuit to, you know, just improve my skill set. but I am 100% uh, self-taught. Wow. Well, let me tell you, um, you all have to follow him on Instagram because he will um, show these recipes and show you how to cook them and just, they look amazing. And yesterday for his anniversary, uh, what was that? Tell us again. Cause, and did you see my note that I need to get three of those? Which so I, actually have some extra, I, have, I have some extra ones. If you're in the area, I could definitely um, send you home with some, but I made for my wife and I's anniversary, I made chocolate stuffed uh, churro popovers with uh, caramel sauce. Um, it was a riff on the dessert that they served at our wedding. We got married at, um, it's actually around the corner from where we live now, but we got married at Can Candela Restaurant. Mm -hmm. So uh, they served uh, caramel stuff uh, churros with chocolate drizzle um, at our wedding. So I just did a, a different riff on it. That's awesome. So um, I'm going to, I want to um, show this picture of your son because I know that you um, cook and you cook mm -hmm. with kids and you go to school. And so I wanted to have you talk a little bit about your experiences at Morehouse. Did you do any cooking there? Um, and then also what you're doing right now in the community to help support the community. Um, I didn't do any cooking in college outside of the home. It was, you know, basic, uh, basic college cuisine with, you know, between me, my roommates and my friends and things like that, tacos, spaghetti, nothing uh, really nuanced. Um, and, but I was involved in AmeriCorps and Jumpstart. So that's where uh, my passion for working with the youth and working with the community began. Um, so I regularly, I have a friend who is the principal at uh, Langston High School in uh, Inglewood. So once or twice a month, depending on the grant money that she's able to get to get the kids supplies, I do free cooking classes for the kids. So it's an awesome opportunity to connect with them, to uh, teach them about uh, you know, proper nutrition, teach them basic uh, cooking techniques, things that they had previously thought were really difficult. Um, they're finding it really easy. So um, that's a passion of mine. It's something that I, I absolutely love doing. So one last thing before we move to the next one, but we're not done with you. Um, sure. Talk a little bit, what is Jumpstart in AmeriCorps in case someone does not know? So uh, Jumpstart, was is a subsidiary of AmeriCorps, which was an after-school uh, tutoring and enrichment program for underprivileged youth. So I was a program manager for Jumpstart from my sophomore through my senior year at Morehouse, and uh, I oversaw Gideon Elementary School in Atlanta. So uh, we would go in, uh, go in. Um, we had a curriculum for the students that we followed for three hours after uh, after regular school let out. We had um, a snack program, uh, free supplies, and um, tutoring service, services for those students. Cool. And if there's, I know that um, you were just talking to someone about Morehouse and their son. So mm -hmm. what would you say was your best experience or share something that you love, liked um, about Morehouse? Um, I always credit Morehouse for, for making me a man. Um, I grew up in LA, but Atlanta and Morehouse made me a man, and it was the best decision that I ever made in my life. Um, if for nothing else, I always tell students the same thing. I have the same spiel. 
I wouldn't trade my, my experience in college for the world. And it didn't necessarily make me smarter, but it made me more well-rounded. And the thing I appreciate most about that experience at Morehouse, besides the education that I got, besides the opportunities that it opened up, and besides how it prepared me for um, the corporate environments that I would eventually step into, the thing that I'm most grateful for are the friendships that I built there. My, my friends from Morehouse and Spelman are still my closest friends, my best friends to this day. Um, my, um, my roommate and best friend from college is Selassie's godfather. Um, another one of my best friends, Marcus's uh, daughter, uh, another one of our friends is, is his guy uh, or her godfather. Um, it just, it gave me lifelong friendships that I don't think I could have forged anywhere else. Um, so I'm really grateful for that experience. I'm really grateful that I attended an HBCU. Um, and I would encourage all uh, students of color and non-students um, non of color as well, because we did have uh, uh, white students at Morehouse to um, consider that experience before any of us. I know there are some struggles with financial aid and scholarships, uh, but I know with Morehouse's endowment and in the time that I was there, most students who graduated from high school with a 3.0 or above got a full academic scholarship. And I think everyone who graduated from high school with a 3.8 or up had a full ride. Um, so there is money available at these institutions. There is money available um, out there through corporate entities and, um, and other um, institutions like that. But I would, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that um, young people consider um, attending an HBCU before a PWI. Okay, awesome. All right, well, next. Thank you so much, Seth, and we're going to come back and talk to you a little bit more, uh, especially okay. your name, okay? <laughs> okay. All right, and so next okay. I want to bring on Mr. John Jones III. So ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know this man, everyone in LA should know this man by today. He is a true game changer, and I met John probably close to like 10 years ago. And John had a vision and John was not gonna stop. And his vision has blown up. When I tell you his vision has blown up, it has just went crazy. And so John, I see you are with us. And these are your lovely children. Who are they? Yeah, so the one that's closest to me with the pink phone is uh, Bethany. Uh, my only son is Joshua and uh, my middle child is Mia, and um, have a one that's not there. My my grandson um, that just came into the fold about a year and a half ago, Mason. Nice, awesome. And so, as I said earlier, John is the CEO of Eastside Riders Bike Club. And so, John, why don't you just talk to us as I go through um, some of the photos? And tell us a little bit about uh, Eastside Bike Club and then some of the things you're doing and you'll see uh, some of the pictures that you shared with us. So um, talk to us that some of the people in our club are in gangs, but when we're on bikes, they get a pass. What is Eastside Riders Bike Club? So Eastside Riders Bike Club is a whole community, whole uh, people transformation bike club. Um, we are um, committed to serving the community. We're committed to, to um, making sure that people who don't have a voice or have a voice that's not really heard, uh, be heard in the cycling world. Um, down in the Watts community, you, you tend to have a lot of folks that are uh, gang members um, and they want to change their lives, but uh, sometimes they don't have those avenues. And uh, one thing that we do know is that uh, cycling brings people together of all walks of life. Um, and one thing we do have in our organization, we've had um, people who, who's, in, who's in gangs and, um, and from different sets um, of gangs that's in our bike club. And when they're riding bikes um, through the communities and when they're together um, in meetings and around the club, uh, they get a pass. I mean, they, from a different neighborhood, you, you know, it's whatever. Right now you are a bike club and we are serving the community. 
So um, folks tend to take off those those gang uh, colors and um, and sit down as a unit as one and ride bikes through the community and, 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 and you know, figure out ways to give back. Awesome. Now, John, because we know that a lot of people in certain communities may not have resources, how do they get these bikes? So um, most of these bikes, like, as you see in this picture right here, um, this is a collaboration with Los Angeles Police Department. And all of those bikes that's in this picture was um, bikes that was that was uh, locked up in uh, police custody because someone either committed a crime on there or the bike was left and was never picked up. Uh, we have a contract, a unique program with the city of Los Angeles uh, from Councilman Herb Wesson and Bruce Gaino's office. We're able to get these uh, bikes, refurbish them with these kids, um, get helmets um, donated from different folks, including Burn, the helmet company. And then we're able to um, teach these kids how to fix these bikes from front to back new rims, new tires, um, new seats. And then uh, these kids, little do they know, at the end of this uh, couple days, our, our, our six hour course, they take these uh, bikes home. They think they're just fixing bikes up and, and they're getting a helmet. There's a picture of kids uh, being happy that they are uh, getting bikes and helmets at the end of a long summer day. That is an amazing, an amazing program, John. Congratulations. I remember when you just had a vision and you were on your own bike. Um, and yeah. you were trying to put this together and to see this and to see these kids and people and adults riding around in the community. So when you have bike rides, about how many people are in these rides? So to date, um, one of our biggest bike rides was our uh, 2014 Ride for Love. We had over 500 people on that bike ride. And I'm talking about blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks of people on these bikes. And when you look back, it was just like a smile to put on your face when you see all of these folks that came out not only to ride for love in the community, but to ride in the watch community and surrounding communities to see, you know, what's going on in the community. And uh, it was really joy for us to see, you know, all those folks come out and want to take part in, uh, in riding bikes. The, the lease is, you know, our little, what we call um, our Friday night rides. You know, it's a couple of people from our bike club, most probably about 10 or 20 that we go out and we ride uh, Watts and we find a landmark like Staples Center, SpaceX, or the, um, or the Home Depot Center, um, our StubHub Center, my bad, sorry about that, they changed the name, StubHub Center and Carson, and we ride from Watts and, and, and we make it to one of those destinations, uh, find something to eat and drink and ride back home. Nice, so if someone wanted to do that, would, is that on your website? Uh, the right, the right now, no rides are up on our website because of um, COVID. COVID nineteen. Uh, COVID nineteen. We haven't really did anything since uh, March, besides uh, feed the people in the community. Um, and that so, is what we're gonna talk about because you say you haven't done anything, but baby, let me tell you, this is where <laughs> Game Changer takes on a whole new, like, definition of um, not doing anything but doing something, and so. Wow, when I think about this, talk to us about feeding the community and what you're doing, where you're doing it, and why you're doing it, and how you're doing it. So um, feeding the community, we're doing it right in Watts, right in what um, could be, should be, the heart of Watts, the most neutral piece of Watts, Compton and 103rd. Uh, we are getting donations from all around, including Southern uh, California, uh, Semper Energy Foundation, um, we're getting we're getting donations from Girl at Annenberg. We're getting Annenberg. We're getting uh, donations from different people um, who really really want to see us succeed. Watch Leadership Institute of uh, two council members, Bruce Gaino and Herb Wesson, again um, that donated to this cause to make sure that people are eating. Um, and we just felt that that it was a need that we seen. Um, March 13th, they made an announcement that schools was going to be out, and um, March uh, 13th. <laughs> Uh, the next the next hour, we said we was feeding people. We knew that we had enough food to feed folks for about a week um, because we was going to have a, a, a breakfast um, for for uh, Cesar Chavez Day uh, for our bike club. So we knew that we had food uh, and, and we knew we had pancake mix. So it was easy for us to say we were going to do a pancake breakfast. That um, pancake breakfast turned into about eight weeks of feeding people in the community. And it started off with 80. Started off with feeding 80 people. Um, and then it, by the end of that week, it went up to about 300 and we 
clearly seen that it was a need and we raised our numbers up to 500. And then the next week we raised our numbers up to 700 and we maxed out at 800. And within those eight, eight and a half weeks, um, we, fell, we fed way o- well over 38,000 people um, to come through the community. And it helped us, helped us learn that people in the community um, was hungry. Uh, we, we found out that breakfast was very crucial for people in the community. And we found out that it was, it was multiple families coming together, hopping in a car and riding to pick up these meals. Um, it was amazing to see, you know, three or four families and us putting 30 meals in a car to feed uh, uh, people who was, who was uh, hungry and taking, taking food back to not only their kids, but their neighbor kids. Um, so it, it was just a very much joy. People picking up meals to go and feed the homeless or the houseless, as we call them. We should be calling them now the houseless. Um, and then folks going out and just um, taking it to um, different sober living homes. So our reach was, was, was pretty good with, with what we started off um, doing was just supposed to be kids. <laughs> we wound up feeding uh, uh, more than uh, we imagine that we'll be we'll be feeding in a short short amount of time. Right, and I remember when you first started, um, you just had a couple of people supporting you. So to see your growth and your reach and the support that not only the community but the uh, funders and nonprofit partners have provided you has been awesome, and I'm so thankful to know you and to call you friend and community partner. So you're doing and, and, great work. And, you know, um, I think if, I'm, if my mind is tooling me right, uh, one of the first people, one of the first um, organizations to, to donate was exactly you, um, Positive Results and Candy, Candy Lewis. Um, you reached out um, right away and said that you wanted to help and you put your money <laughs> where your mouth was and sent us over some funding and it helped kick us kick us off for a couple of more days as well so uh, thank you and to your organization for helping us uh, uh, with, with feeding the community well it's my community too and you do great work and I'm thankful I think it's important that you know we can all do something we may not be able to um, donate thousands of dollars, but if you got $5, donate it. If you can go out and volunteer, do that. Show up in some kind of form or fashion. It is critical. And so it is just an honor to be able to support you. And yeah, man. talk about this last photo before we move on, John. I mean, I don't know how powerful this photo is going to be. Um, within years to come, but this was something that was put together in about um, maybe 36 hours. Um, I just felt that something needed to be done. Watts has went through a ride 55 years ago. Watts went through a ride 28 years ago. We didn't want 20, 28 years ago to, for another ride to happen in Watts. So I got on a phone call and I called a couple of people um, on the ground. Um, And I said, uh, we need to get together. We need to do something. We need to talk. We need to figure out a way if if our community is going to protest, we need to protest peacefully and we need to get in front of it. We not need to wait for something to happen for us to react. Um, So I got their buy-in. Then I called a few of the pastors I know in the area, including um, um, the Watts area ministers, uh, one of the oldest uh, black churches in Watts, uh, Pastor Shane Scott of Macedonia Baptist Church. And um, after that, I got on the phone with the elected officials. And when I, when I got on the phone with the elected officials, the first one that I called, of course, was uh, my former boss, um, Joe Buscaino. And uh, he said immediately, whatever I, need, whatever I need to do, I'm there. And um, it kind of surprised me <laughs> in a way, but I was happy that um, he was willing to help out. He understood the severity. He understood the moment that it's time to step up. Um, and then I, I sent a few emails out to a, um, the gang task force and the police department. And um, the police came back. I sent it out to two captains and a, a commander, or no, a deputy chief got back to me. Um, uh, deputy Scott got back to me and said, whatever you need, we'll be there. And uh, she showed up. Um, everyone showed up. And this right here, what this picture shows um, the, one of the pastors from the Watts area ministers. He said that we need to go into the most humbling position to the throne of grace and uh, pray 
for our, 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 our uh, city. And uh, he asked everyone to take a knee. And uh, this picture right here captured us taking a knee um, and, and as he prayed um, for, for, for not only our city, but for our country. Wow. Well, that's very powerful. This is very powerful. And I want to put a pin in this because I want all of the men to have conversation about this in just a little bit. So thank you so much, John. And I want to move on to Mr. Jeremy, you still with us? I'm here. All right, Mr. Jeremy, we finally got to you. And no, I'm you man, I, no, I just want to say, man, I appreciate uh, beautiful brothers that spoke for me, man. Y'all are true inspiration, man. I was just getting chills. Like, legit, honestly, man, just hearing your words. So understand, man, you guys are definitely doing amazing work. And uh, you guys are definitely inspiration, for sure. Awesome. Yes, they are. They are very inspirational. And that's why there are all three of you all are on today. And I think it's important that we highlight um, men. And we highlight Black men because very often we hear the not so great side. But there are so many amazing Black men that are doing amazing work. And so I want to highlight you all. And so we've got this picture here of Comfort LA. Now, I met you once, but my daughter, Melinda, knows you very well and you've worked together. Um, yeah, and she definitely. talked about you so much. It was like you were another child of mine. I was like, did I have another <laughs> son or something? So, oh, well. you did yeah, a good so, job, well, for sure. So talk to us and tell us a little bit about Comfort LA. Uh, all right. Well, well, Comfort LA originally was a uh, was a pop up concept that I created uh, in 2015. Um, long story short, uh, I catered an event downtown for like a bunch of black uh, businessmen and business owners. Especially, I met my partner who had access to a kitchen space, and literally two weeks later, we were able to uh, open Comfort LA. Mm. So um, it's uh, I consider it a, a community hub. It started off as a, just like a walk-up window for bars on it, only open late night on the weekends, and it's uh, grown to um, two locations, uh, food truck and the catering company. So it's, uh, it's been, a, been, a, been a beautiful, difficult, beautiful journey, you know, but uh, anything worth working for is worth having. Absolutely. So did you name it Comfort as in Comfort Food? Because all yeah, this you know, food here look like comfort to me. And after I leave um, Chris's place with those chocolate churros, I need to head to Comfort LA or Comfort Inglewood. No, nah, yeah, yeah, you already know. Whenever, whenever you come through, it'll be a holiday. So. Yeah. I appreciate it. No, nah, yeah, we, uh, what, what we, um, primary cuisine, like you said, is, is comfort food. Um, I wanted to uh, create a name that was encompassing of a, a feeling more than anything. But it's also relatable to to the masses. So, why the better name than Comfort LA? You know, um, it was it was something that I felt like me coming from Cleveland, Ohio, and just being out here at the period of time that I that I that I have been. It's uh, comfort was something that I felt like was missing from the city. Um, where I'm from, people show a lot of love. You know, what I mean, support, and not that it isn't love here by any stretch, but you know, people tend to be more. They got to get to it. You know, what I mean, how do I get to my next? my next payday. So I just wanted to give people a, a place where they could come chill, feel like family, you know, and nothing pretentious, you know, just everybody gets treated the same and it's always love every time you pull up. That's what's up. So um, I've been to your place. You um, do some amazing work with youth and you yeah. have the restaurant inside and then you walk down towards the back. I'm thinking I'm mm -hmm. going like to the bathroom or something. And there's this whole backyard space. I'm like, wait, yeah. what is going on? That's the comfort backyard right there. That's 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 more more of a family environment. You know, we all can relate to family reunions, you know, cookouts. But that's that's pretty much the atmosphere I, you know, I we try to replicate in the back and I feel like we did a pretty decent job. So do you have um, different events? Can somebody rent this space out? Yeah, or? absolutely. I mean, a lot of things have changed. I mean, there are new normals that we're going to have to accept moving forward, you know, sure. unfortunately. But but prior to, absolutely. Um, it, like I said, the, my whole restaurant is built off community, love. Um, people coming in, feeling like family. So we did a lot of, we did a lot of dope events 
at a uh, event that's showing right now, Soulful and Noise. That, that's what we have every first Sunday. Huge event uh, where different different bands, different uh, poets, you know, singers, all come under one roof and just get to express their talent, you know, to the uh, to a, a fairly large group of people. And it's just like I said, it's, it's family, you know. Awesome. And I do apologize. I'm actually in the kitchen cooking as we speak. So if you hear a lot of noises and banging, it's it's, it's definitely going up in here. <laughs> okay, well I heard that pot banging. That's why I'm like, okay, now are you in Inglewood or are you downtown? Yeah, and you are I'm, I'm open, asking. huh? Yes, definitely. Um, our Inglewood location opens today at four. Our downtown location opens at opens at one, and we are um, due to the um, to the surge in in being proactive in black support. We've been busier these last two days than we have been in some months. So it's been a beautiful blessing. But at the same time, production still has to be done. Nice, nice. And so let's just talk. I'm a, I'm a, I know you're busy, but talk to Not us no about the work you do with the boys and the young men. Oh, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, well, 2018, I started a program called Hustlenomics. Um, I started in Santee High School with the lovely Melinda, who uh, set me up and like I said, man, that's just right there. I, I, I appreciate her so much. But but basically the concept is um is uh finding black boys, find about finding what they're interested in. Uh, we basically create a hustle. So the objective is that you have a sustainable business while you're in high school. So by the time you graduate high school, you can even make the decision, hey, do I want to continue on my business or do I want to go to school? Um, me personally, I didn't go to, to college or I did go to I, didn't, I went to college for two years to play football. But once football was over, I didn't like I knew school wasn't wasn't for me. That's just something I knew. So I just want to just create a lane where you can understand that, you know, entrepreneurs, you're, you're, you're your own boss. You don't, it doesn't matter how, how old you are, what age it is, you to run a sustainable business. So I really want to change, change the narrative of what is necessary when you leave high school and just give a couple options for the boys and let them know, you know, somebody's here to help. Wow. That's important. And that was another reason I select all, all three of you, because each one of you has chosen a lane to be an entrepreneur you've chosen a lane to feed the community to feed your family to feed them not just food but knowledge your game Absolutely. changers you know Absolutely. so I, I love that um and so I, I think yes so i'm gonna leave this picture up with uh educating the kids because what i like to do is invite all three of you gentlemen um to talk but before we actually do that um, Seth slash Chris slash Christopher, can you talk to us a little bit about your name? So, um, that's a frequently asked question. When I, um, long story short, when I started my career in, um, in entertainment as a stylist, I knew there was a possibility, as has happened, that I was gonna have to go back and forth between um, corporate world and the entertainment world, just depending on how it ebbed and flowed and what was going on. Um, and I wanted to keep the two of those separate. And because, um, you know, I'll just be blunt because white people are very, very um, curious um, about the, what's oftentimes the only black face in the audience. I created a moniker. Um, for my entertainment endeavors. Um, and I got the name from the 1985 classic, The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. Um, and his name, you know, in the movie is Seth Rundle. And I picked it because it's my sa second favorite sci-fi movie of all time. And then um, the other reason was because I was a stylist and I was making people fly. So I was like, I am the fly, therefore I'm Seth Rundle. It was really corny, but it stuck. So. That's how um, that's how I selected the the moniker um, that I use in entertainment, um, and that was the reason why. And it's it's stuck since then, so I just I stay with it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And I know I love the fly. Oh my I, god. That movie and is the, amazing. Yes, and yes. the actor, I think I was in love with him at one point. Just amazing. So um, I asked each of you gentlemen, I want to talk to you about um, what is it is it, what should people know about black men? Because see, first off, I want to say as a black woman who had a black father who has a black husband and has a black son, 
um, and I work with black men and we do programs including promoting healthy manhood for boys and men. Um, I don't think that we celebrate you enough. And I know that everyone that I know loves you, but let's talk, to, uh, let's talk to the world as a black man and as a man. What is it that we need to know as women, as people, as community, as white folks, as uh, funders, what do people need to know about you? Um, I just, I, I, I'll go first if uh, my other brothers don't mind. But one of the things I wanted to, I wanted to course correct, and I kind of got the same sense from John and Jeremy when they were talking, um, I don't necessarily feel like I'm not celebrating. And I personally feel like we don't celebrate Black women enough. Mm -hmm. I know that I have been enabled to be who I am, um, to accomplish what I have, um, and to enjoy what the life that I do because of Black women, because of my mother, my grandmother, because of you, um, because of my wife, because of the black women in my life. So I would just like to say, first of all, that I feel like I am celebrated enough and we don't celebrate black women enough. Um, and I hope that, you know, you guys know that you are appreciated as well. Um, but in terms of being a black man and what I think people should know about black men is that we are not a monolith. It, it is not being a black man doesn't mean just one thing. We are everything. We are every man. And even with the three of us who you asked to speak today, um, even though we are three dark-skinned black men who are in culinary, the three of us are three fundamentally different people um, who have different aspirations, different passions, um, different preferences and everything else. So I would just like to state that first of all, that the black man is not one thing. We are every man. And that's something I'm very, it's a, it's a group that I'm very, very proud to be a part of. And in terms of, I think you asked this too, in terms of manhood itself, I think that the definition of manhood and black masculinity has been vastly misconstrued. And I was raised by a strong black man who taught me that my manhood was rooted in the way that I took care of my responsibilities. Not how many women I was sleeping with, not the fact that I'm heterosexual, not the fact that um, I can fight or any other you know, superficial characteristic or trait you can put on me. I am a man, I am a black man, and I am exemplary because I take care of my responsibilities as a man. Um, I love on uh, my black woman, I take care of my black son, um, and I take care of my black ass responsibilities. So that's what makes me a man and nothing else. Oh. Um, so, well, yeah. I'm all with that. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. I, I love that. And um, yeah. I appreciate you saying what you said about women. And oh, so I know I feel the love, but I know that many of my sisters don't. Um, and it's not necessarily for one reason or another. There's multiple reasons, but I also know that there's a lot of men that I talk to that don't feel the love. So this is all about love and sharing love. And I thank you for bringing that into the conversation. Of course. Absolutely. All right. So John or Jeremy, would you like to jump in? Go ahead and take yourself off mute. Yep. There I go. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's um it's important. Um wait, okay, I thought I messed something up. <laughs> I think it's important that um that we do let folks know that we are not to be um feared, you know, uh the, the black man, because a lot of people see us and they automatically get uh nervous, scared, tuck their purses, hide their keys, cross the whole street just to come by us. Um, we're just as human as anyone else. Um, we're just as loving as anyone else. Um, and that, that we mean no harm or no fear to no one unless we are provoked just like anyone else. And we're trying to protect just like anyone else. So um, just know that, that, that us black men is not to be feared, but to be um, loved just like everyone else. 
Oof. John, you said more than a word. I have conversation with uh, my my son, who is a tall, big black man, and he says everywhere he goes, people looks him up and down. It's almost like they're afraid of him or trying to figure out why are you here because you know people fear something. Um, and a black a black man and a big black man for some reason scares people. And I just don't understand because every man that I know, every man that I know is usually humble. They are considerate. They work hard. They care for their family and they love. And, and I'm so glad we're talking about this today. So Jeremy, you, you're unmuted. So talk to us and tell us and um, no, and absolutely. You know, it's, like, it's while you're talking to us, can you tell us about that beard? Because uh, that's what, <laughs> that's all your your whole thing is about. I'm like my beard be oh, like. No, it's, it's, my beard be like. Yeah, that was uh that was when I first introduced me Instagram. I was just kind of stuck. But uh, yeah, the beard the beard is definitely uh, a symbolic of strength. You know, um, I mean, men grow beards. I, I, I didn't say too much else other than that. But uh, to go back to the topics I was just uh, spoken on, um, John hit it on the head. Um, me as well, being an extremely large black man, it's fear. I guess I'm so used to it, you know, and I always like my natural, um, my natural vibe is to be loving, you know, so a lot of the times, I'm perceived as one way, but after you get to talk to me and sit down for a second, you understand that, you know, big black guys are are, are okay. We, we won't bite. So I I know I know that that's pretty much the primary in my life, um, the looks, the stares. But I also realize that we're strong, we're powerful. It's the reason that they're looking at us, you know, because they see the power in us, you know. And some people, some people it scares them. Some people, you know, embrace it and love it. But at this point in my life, I've just I've learned to take those take those stairs and be more appreciative, more be more appreciative of them because that means they see me, you know. So um, that's pretty much uh, the basis of my life. I try to take all all negatives and, and put them to positives because you can't have the dark without the light. Yeah. So, so um, uh, with, with that being said, that's through my experience. That's that's probably the the, the number one hit the nail on the head, like I said, John. And yeah. Awesome. It's Thank a you. difficult struggle, but if you can if you can get through this, man, it's nothing that you can't get through. Uh, nothing that you can't get through. I, I want to come and get some of that food. Um, I need uh, addresses in the whole menu. I got addresses I got for you. Oh. I got addresses <laughs> for everybody. So be, sure. before we end this, I do have a page. As a matter of fact, let me just go there now. So if anyone needs to know, we've got Jeremy McBride with Comfort LA. We've got his Instagram for both him, uh, for his personal and his restaurant, his website, and where the restaurant is in Los Angeles. Um, and if you hit up his email, or excuse me, his website, you'll definitely find his location in Inglewood. This slide will stay on, and this uh, conversation is also recorded, and everyone will receive copies of this slide, uh, of this entire presentation. And then uh, John Jones the Third East Side Riders Bike Club, and his Instagram handle, website, and his address. And this is also um, when he's serving breakfast. It's just down the street. He's right on the corner of 103rd and Wilmington. Is it no? Is it Wilmington, John? It it is Compton and 103rd. But right now we're serving out of that address. Okay, awesome. And then we've got Seth Brundle, the Brundle Fly Group, and um, his Instagram handle as well as how to reach him via email. And so um, I'm going to have a little bit more conversation, but each one of these gentlemen do uh, amazing work, amazing work. And I would love for all of us to support them in some form or fashion. But since you all are, are chefs, Let's talk a little bit about uh, food insecurity. And John, you really hit it on the head when you were talking about how people in the community, you, you, did not, you knew that they were hungry. You didn't know how hungry they were. So, and I know um, Chris, 
you serve the uh, you serve the community you help the kids and jeremy does as well so let's talk a little bit about insecurity food insecurity and john uh, let's take you first because i know you have to hop off this call and um i do thank you so much for being on you have been a blessing to me personally I love the work you do. We positive results and Candy Lewis will continue to support you in all that you do. And all you have to do is just, you know how to hit me up. <laughs> Call me, text me, email me. And um, when you're downtown, let me know because you know we'll come and we have your back always. Yes, ma'am. All yes, right. Ma so so ours was just knowing the community, knowing the need. Um, one thing we did understand and know is that um, the watch community was prepared for what other communities wasn't prepared for. And let's say that again, the watch community was paired and low income communities was prepared for what other community was not prepared for. And that means we've been living paycheck to paycheck. We've been living under the poverty line. We've been living food to food bank and trying to figure out where our next meal was going to come from. This is new to other people. So our community was a little bit there. It was there, but they, was, they didn't understand the severity of it. They didn't understand the impact of not being able to go to school and not being able to go to work and not being able to, um, to, put a, to, to feed their kids three times a day because they was used to the school feeding them twice and then them feeding them once. Right. So we just came in and gave them a chance to, ha to not worry about one meal, one meal for that day. And so now we are saying, you know, um, it's, it's, it's okay to be hungry and it's okay for other folks to, to understand what's going on in our community. And we're giving them a chance to use the monies that they did get to, to, to put those on kids, you know, their new clothes, they, they need new clothes. So you can use that money instead of worrying about breakfast or lunch or whatever, buy your kids some new socks and shoes. Um, this is where we step in and help with over 38,000 um, folks that came to our breakfast. And a lot of them was repeat repeat people that came and we was we got to know um the community a little bit better nice john just i am so honored i'm i'm so happy um that your touch you your footprint has changed the game for the entire city of los angeles and uh congratulations you're a new commissioner and so <laughs> That's amazing. I've been a commissioner for the planning department. What commission are you with? With the Department of Transportation. I'm actually about to go hop on that right now. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm going to just ask one last question. If there's anything that you could think of that could help either you or Watts or the community, what would that be? Um, for more people to to believe in in the community, more people to believe in cycling in low income communities, and more people to want to come out and feed. That was one of the first things we did with Eastside Riders was go out and we fed the hungry. At that time, we called them the homeless, and uh, we went out and we fed them. Um, before we even thought about doing any bicycle stuff, we 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 did get on bikes and we went and we fed the hungry. So um, if anybody, you know, if you have ways to want to give back and you want to help people and you want to help feed people and you want to help uh, teach kids bicycle safety and education, you know, connect with us and let's, uh, let's continue to, to bridge the gap. Because I think everyone on this call hopefully has, has a background with riding bikes so they understand the importance of, of, of a bike in the community and uh, low-income communities as well. All right. Thank you, John. We will no definitely problem. keep you posted and um, I'll talk to you in a little bit. All right, bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Right, Just, uh, hey, um, so Seth and Jeremy, let's pick it up, talking about food insecurity. What have you seen? What do you know? Um, and then what can we, um, as people do, as community members do, especially in light of what's going on today? And that, that might be two different things. I'm going to let Jeremy take that since he's working. Ah, no worries, brother. Right? Hop a little, little sooner. <laughs> All right. Um. Well, it, I, can, I can say pay, more than anything, pay attention to your surroundings. You know, be kind to those who are around you that you know are in need. You know, especially during these difficult times. It's um, 
sometimes I know we um we have we have larger ideas and larger plans, but and sometimes that can deter us from feeling like we can do anything, you know. So I just say be proactive in your 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 day to day existence. You know, it's a tough time on everybody, and if there are ways you can help, you know, show love, send love. You know, small gestures go a long way. You know, to the morale of, of everybody. You know, so make a couple small gestures. Those small gestures can lead to extremely large. Can I answer your question? Hello? Um, if you could Hello? say, when you said uh, make a small gesture, can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah. That, that's um, like, like uh, for, for example, um, um, my original lo location is downtown um, in the heart of, of Skid Row. You know, being down there, being down there that's probably considered um, an un undesirable place, you know, but at the end of the day, when you do small gestures, like give plates to those who, who are hungry at the end of the night, and people can, can look at you as as a help and understand that you're not just there uh, for profit or there for gain. You know, I feel like it goes it goes a long way. It, it, it more so, so humanizes. And I feel like those small gestures are more necessary to the, to the grand scheme than anything, you know, so. Yeah. I just, I just, I, I, I live by that, you know. Um, sometimes I know I'm, I'm a big dreamer, so I put large things in my head, and when I don't, when I don't necessarily fulfill them, um, I sometimes get mad at myself. So I'm just aware that small gestures matter, you know. Showing love when you, showing love when you can, you know. You know that. I'm pretty sure we all had to have that uh, homeless guy we know that stays around the corner from us. You know, bring him water, bring us some food. You know, just, just a lot of small gestures. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm I'm s such a big fan of dreaming big. I think that is important. I talk to my team all the time. If your dream is big, make it bigger, because if you can't accomplish it today, it's gonna come a time where you can. And I've always been the the person that. I may not give you cash, but if you tell me you're hungry, I'm gonna go in that restaurant and I'm gonna buy you a plate. I'm gonna go in the grocery store and I'm gonna buy you some food. You know, right. so I think it's important that we stop and think that sometimes when people ask you, they might ask you for some money, ask them, are you hungry? You right. know, so buy them a plate. And I've been in many restaurants where the owner said, oh, you're buying that person a plate. Well, I'm gonna I'm pay half of it for you. Um, so, grand gestures, small gestures are huge. Absolutely. All right, Chris, what you got to say? Um, John and Jeremy didn't need that much to say. I would, the, <laughs> the one piece of advice that I would give to people um, is to give up their time. Um, there's this disgusting stereotype that children of color only aspire to be rappers and basketball players and all that other stuff. And I've found through my experience in various community organizations since I was 18 years old in college that the difference maker in these kids' lives a lot of times is exposure. They, they are so insular in a lot of cases, they don't even know what's possible. So people giving up their time and their experience and their resources makes a world of difference in their lives when they know what is possible. Um, when I've given that advice in the past to people, their response is always, well, I don't do anything cool like you. I don't, I'm not on TV and stuff like that. And it's like, that's, I was, you know, if I remember my, my, my high school graduating class, you know, my middle school graduating class, I was one of a few who wanted, you know, a career in this industry. And I have friends who I graduated with from, you know, all the way from Pasadena to San Pedro, you know, who do all types of amazing things in fields and careers that, you know, I had never heard of previous to them going in it. And all it takes is that little bit of exposure. If you're, you know, a tax attorney and, you know, you're looking at a 15 year old kid and you don't think that they're interested because they're a teenager, sometimes that's that, that spark that that child needs at that time. They just need to know what's possible. They're good at, uh, at uh, they're good analysts. Uh, they're good uh, with finances and numbers and different things like that. 
And if they understood what was possible for their skill set, their strengths and different things like that, it could make the world of difference in, you know, their universe. It could be the difference between, you know, them going into a field or career that they're not really passionate about, but they mama pushed them into getting a city job, a county job, you know, a TSA job or whatever the case is, but there's so there's a world of possibility for these children that they don't even know is possible. And that's one of the things that I love about working with these children in these school settings is just letting them know like there's a there's a world of ingredients out here that are available to them. There are a myriad of different tech, uh, cooking techniques that they can uh, implement on these these same ingredients that they might be used to. They might have never you know, had whatever it is, um, and they just don't know it's possible until somebody shows them. So I would just say my biggest piece of advice is for people to give up their time. If there's a career day at your old high school, a local high school, a middle school, um, a fraternity organization for Alphas, we have Alpha Esquires. There are all types of organizations, um, you know, for these kids that house these kids, and they're just waiting on people to, to volunteer their time. So. so true. That's so true. I, I was just talking to a friend of mine. His name is Captain Brent Burton, and he's with the fire department. Um, he is also with 100 Black Men of Los Angeles, and we talk all the time about mentors, and it, it, he talks about the difficulty of finding men, especially, who want to mentor and spend time with youth. And one thing, people think, oh, well, kids want this and they want that. Yeah. Kids want time. They want time. They, they want, want you time. to yeah. invest your time with them because then it builds their esteem and it lets them know that there's a possibility. There's two words that I love. There's uh, opportunity and possibilities. And if I don't know that that opportunity as a possibility is available, then I just don't know. Right. So I'm glad you brought that into the conversation. So before we move into our final um, topic, I wanted to find out, we have some guests on the line and I'm wondering if anyone has any questions for John, um, Seth, or what, for Jeremy. And I see John is actually on another call, but he might be able to take a call. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. All right, no questions? All right then. Well, then I'm going to continue on. Oh, I hear someone? No? All right, so listen. We are, we are living in a different time. And what I love about this time is that our young people have stepped up. And our young people said they're not going to deal with this anymore. And our, it does take. It takes people, it takes investment, it takes time, and it takes youth to make a difference. As a mature woman, I can help and I can support, but I know that one of the things that we've been doing here uh, with positive results is we have been vested in our youth to be peer advocates and peer leaders. And if we haven't seen anything in the last week, I've seen nothing but youth and young adults make this world like stand on its head. And so I want to hear from you all. Um, what are your thoughts about what's been going on, um, not only with, with um, murders of black men and, and black children and black women, um, but also with the protest and with police and, and with the community? Anything that you want to uh, bring into this conversation, let's have that conversation. We've got about 20 minutes left to have that conversation. Um, you want to go, Jeremy? Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, uh, more than anything, it's, um, it's extremely unfortunate, uh, the catalyst behind it. But it was, it was going to happen. It's, it was due to happen. And I'm just... I'm ecstatic at us, you know, in our response and the unity that we've shown, you know, um, 
everything is not going perfect. You know, I feel like we're all learning as it goes on. You know, we understand that there are powers that are out of our control that are involved and can control certain narratives. You know what I mean? But overall, as a unit, I feel like it's it's really it's it's making the divide for the best. I feel like you know, it's putting it's put it's, it's bringing everything to the light. You know, you 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 can't hide anymore. You know, and and I think that's the most important part. You know, what I mean, identifying and at least knowing. Who the enemy really is? Um, like I said, it's, it's it's extremely unfortunate. But this time was was due, you know. And um, it's I'm ter terrible happened. I, I I don't wish that death on on anybody. But at the same time, a phoenix will rise through the, from the ashes. And um, I I'm I'm optimistic about the direction, you know. And I, I and I feel like this isn't something that's just gonna pass. Like this is something we're going to stay on top of until change is actually made. And for that, I, I am grateful. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I was, um, I mean, I have similar sentiments. I think the thing that's apparent this time around um, is that there are systematic changes that need to be made. And right. we need to clean house nationwide. Um, I am not satisfied at the arrests that were made of, uh, of George Floyd's murder. I'm not satisfied that uh, Breonna Taylor's case was reopened. I'm not going to be satisfied until we make systematic changes countrywide throughout every single government organization. And that's going to be the thing to prevent another George Floyd, another Breonna Taylor, another Maude Arbery. That's the thing that's going to make the difference. So. I appreciate the fact that even though we have had the arrest that the protests are still going on because uh, this is not going to be a one-off type of thing where we're satisfied until, uh, until we get that systematic change that we're talking about. So it's, I'm, I'm very satisfied to see that happening. Um, it's been different for me this time around and heavier for me this time around because now I'm a father um, and I have different concerns for my own son. I, I, I always understood my mother's, um, her sense of urgency and fear whenever I would leave the house and telling me to be careful. I always knew why she was so serious about that. Um, you know, but you worrying about your own safety and then you worrying about your child's safety are two completely different things. Um, so it's really hit me in, you know, a way that it, that it hasn't before. And I've just been satisfied, like you said, to see the young people out doing the actual, you know, footwork. This is the first time that I haven't been able to protest because I do have a one-year-old son and I am in the house, you know, with him 24-7 due to COVID. Um, but I'm grateful that I can still do the work from home. Uh, my wife and I have donated to a number of organizations. We've sent a million emails. We're doing all that we can from our own homes and we will continue to, and we need to continue to. So, um, so I'm, I'm like Jeremy said, I feel optimistic, especially more so than I did last week. Um, because we've seen so much progress already. We've seen individuals, um, and companies and allies uh have our backs and fight this fight for and with us like we never have before so for that i'm i'm eternally grateful um but i'm not patting anybody on the back either because yeah. this issue is not our issue it's not a problem that we created it's a sickness that white people have perpetuated for the past 400 plus years um so they need to be the primary um, catalyst for change. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Right. And Absolutely. Talking, that's real talk, all of that. You know, um, this time is taking, it's, it's really difficult and it's different for me as well. Um, I was a child uh, in the Watts riot, but I remember it. And then I was a mother 
with um, three children in the Rodney King uh, melee, riot, uh, protest. And that was really hard because I was scared. I was scared for my kids. I was scared for, my, for myself. I was scared for my community. And I'm still scared because 28 years later, half of my community still has not been rebuilt. And, you know, I talked about this, that I was not, cons I wasn't upset that people wanted to protest. I think protest is good. Um, I was just concerned that our community would be devastated again. And I say again, because it's been devastated and there are certain areas that has not in 28 years, has not improved. There's still burnt up land and empty blocks just all over our community. And so I love that the world took notice this time. That's what's different. The world took notice all over the world. People are, are protesting and they're making a statement and it's being led by the youth. And I think that is powerful. That is so positive. I am just proud. I'm, I'm proud to see my son and my daughter and my nieces and my nephews and everyone, the people that I know, the people that I love, out taking a stand, taking a fist, taking a knee and making a difference. And so, John, are you able to join us really quick? Is there anything you want to say? Nope. John's still on the call. All right. Well, listen. Um, We've got 10 minutes left. Let me ask, do we have any other questions? No questions from anyone? So then I wanna know, um, Seth, Chris, if there's any one thing that people should know um, about this time, whether it is about being a father or a husband, a man or black man, because you are a man. You are a black man and you are a husband, a father, a son, um, you are a brother. Um, and I'd wanna know if there's anything that people should be aware of as you've been watching what's been going on over the last week or over the last 30 plus years. What, what do you wanna share? Um, I just wanna reinforce to people that we have a long road ahead. Um, and this is not a race, it's, it's America. And we should all respond accordingly. So if you give your all for a week, if you march for a week, if uh, you walk in, if you're protesting, if you're doing all that other stuff and you feel fatigue, it's okay to take time off. It's okay to go home and collect yourself it's okay to step away for a second. If last week was probably one of the most depressing of my entire life. And for, I think four days straight, I did not wake up and start drinking before noon for like four days straight. Um, and thank God, I eventually started to come out of that and started to combat that depression that I was feeling like you were saying earlier. I was just extremely, extremely down, extremely depressed and extremely like impacted by what was going on. So, um, you know, like you said about these times specifically, I would just encourage people to pace themselves and to, to allow themselves to feel, to allow themselves a break to allow themselves to rage, to allow themselves to fight, to protest, to do whatever it is that feels naturally to them, just as long as it is, um, it's not harmful for the movement. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that includes, I, 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 I've detested the criticisms about uh, the protests themselves even when, um, you know, as we know now is not the case, but even when there was speculation that the protesters themselves were rioting and looting and different things like that. We learned violence from our oppressors. That's how they came into power in the first place. So 
it is insane to hear those same people who inflicted that oppression on us and still do to a certain degree, whether it's predatory lending or, um, you know, just systematic racism throughout the, 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 uh, the working world or whatever the case is. Um, I just, I hated to hear that type of, of criticism of the movement, but I also would encourage people too, like you said, we have communities and our communities have stayed intact, thankfully. It's other communities, which I wish it happened in the 90s. It's other communities that are being um, vandalized, thankfully, but um, you know, I would just encourage uh, everybody to continue fighting the good fight and to do things that benefit the movement and not hurt it. Yeah, thank you. I 100% agree. And I also love that you allow space for people to do what is good for them um, and to take a break. And I heard you mention not only yesterday, but today, uh, mental health. It, it does not mean that you're crazy. Right. Um, it does mean that sometimes we just have to have someone else that we can talk to and we can share what's going on so that it gives us a little bit more peace. And, and I, I I'm so happy you touched upon that because I'm, I'm glad that the, the stigma of uh, therapy and mental health has been slowly lifting off of our community and the men in our community. I've been in therapy for two years straight and it's been one of the best possible things I could have done for myself. And this past Saturday, like I was saying last week was so bad, I scheduled, I have, I have not had a session since the shelter in place order started because I just prefer in-person sessions, but I scheduled an emergency session with my therapist uh, this past Saturday, um, just because I felt like I had too many emotions, too much rage, too much sadness, too much anguish, and I couldn't, I couldn't filter it all. So I had a great session. Um, his name is David Brown. I can share that information too. Um, but I had a great session with David and I'm glad that I did schedule that session. Um, but I would encourage everybody to absolutely patronize their, uh, their mental health professional, especially absolutely. times like these. I totally agree. Thank you so much. Hey, John. I appreciate that. But I'm, I think Jeremy, I need that as well. Okay. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I definitely okay. want to get the get information to your therapist as well. So maybe you can put that in the chat. Um, and then also when we send this video out, I'll make sure that everyone gets that. I'll add um, um, a contact information. So Jeremy and John, uh, Jeremy, I know you're cooking and John, you're on a call. I don't know if you're able to join us and give us any last final thoughts. I mean, I mean, um, Seth hit it on the head again. Feel me like it's a matter of, of checking on yourself because it's, if you're not good, how can you be good for somebody else? You know, yeah. um, take those take those baby steps. You know, it seems like a lot right now. You know what I mean? But but do take small steps to make change. You know, more more than anything, continue to continue to check on yourself. It's a lot. What we're seeing is it is it natural? It shouldn't be like this. You know, it's traumatic. You know, but unfortunately, it's the world we live in. It's, it's, the, it's the nature of the beast. So a little understanding comes in with that, and understand that. We built for it, you know. If we wouldn't be going through it, if we couldn't get through it, so. Absolutely. Right. Um, and I want to go back because someone asked me for this slide, so I I want to make sure that I share this information. Um, before we get off of this, and I just want to uh, to let everyone know how much I appreciate you all for being here today and for sharing these amazing men um and i lovingly call my son black man and his name is carl carl lewis the third um he is a fitness instructor he is a beast with power moves but all his life i've called him black man hey black man and um chris you said something earlier that your mom would say you know be careful and i would say to all my kids be careful be safe every single time they walked out the door, be careful, be safe. And so I put this back up because there is so much love and respect that I, that we, the community, that this world, if they don't have, I need them to have it. I need them to get back to this place that we love and respect black men. I think it is important. I think it's critical. I think it's also important that we allow ourselves 
space and time to understand that we are living in a different world and in a different time. We've been locked in our homes and away from our family and friends for three months. We have experienced loss. Um, we have lost jobs. We have lost time. We've lost energy. We have lost finances, we, there's so much that we've lost, but there's been some gain as well. And I think it's the, the gain of reconnecting with who we are as real people and slowing down and sharing love and actually seeing people and being a little bit nicer and kinder. I know that I've increased my relationship with my family and it's been beautiful and even with my team, and, but I know that there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of trauma. And so if you need help, I will encourage you to contact us that we work to address trauma, um, cultural trauma, that institutional trauma, the intergenerational trauma. We are here to help and support you. We also have resources that we can refer you to other people. I do want to take the time to say thank you to John Jones. He's busy doing his commission work. He's a new commissioner. Um, I want to thank Seth Brundle, Christopher McMullen, um, a longtime friend. Man, I am so proud of you. I just, I just like want to jump for joy. Um, and to see you as a father and a husband brings me much, much joy. Um, and then also for Jeremy McBride, congratulations on your restaurant. I'm going to need everyone to, um, let me go back. Let me go back to this last page. I would like you all to go and like them on Instagram. And don't forget to like positive results on Instagram. That's at the positive results. Um, that's our Instagram. Go to our Facebook page and uh, like us. Um, go to their Facebook pages and like them, follow them, learn what you can do, even if it is to send $5 or to show up and see how you could support or donate a bike or go to one of their restaurants and support them. The community needs you. And remember, when you see a black man, don't be afraid of him. Talk to him, smile at him, because he is amazing. He is wonderful and I love them, and I love you. So thank you so much. Is there anything anyone wants to say before we log on out of here? No? Well, on that note, I'm gonna say thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen, for being my guest today. Oh, Seth, you've unmuted yourself. Did you wanna say something? No, I was just gonna say I did share uh, my therapist's information uh, for everybody who wanted it. Um, so look in the, uh, the chat, uh, or I could just, I could send it to anybody too. Jeremy, if you need it, I can, I, I'll DM it to you now. Bro, that's a bet, bro. And, I, and I'll follow you as well, man. Okay. okay. For sure. And for everyone, you will receive, um, this entire presentation and I'll make sure that when I send this out, I will include the therapist information. So thank you all. Be blessed. Make sure that you use your time, your talents, your resources to support lives. And remember the Black Lives Matter. Thank you and blessings to you all. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Thank you for feeding my soul. You're welcome, Valerie. Yay. 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 It's always Talk. good to see you. I'll see you in the morning, right? I'll see you bright and early. Yes, Taking notes. I was taking notes. Have a good one. Talk to you later. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Love you. Love you too. Hey, Mario. I see you. Tracy, Vicky, Christy.